this interview is a part of the Oral History Project sponsored by the State Bar of New Mexico and the Senior Lawyers Division. I'm Freddie Romero. I'm a member of the Senior Lawyers Division conducting an interview with Dean and Professor Leo Romero uh, from the UNM Law School. Today is October 26, 2023, and the interview is being conducted at the offices of the New Mexico State Bar. Uh, Professor Romero, I want to thank you very much for being here today. Uh, you know, we're collecting a lot of these interviews and we post them on the State Bar uh, website. And uh, what we're trying to do is uh, get the history not only of the judiciary and the legal community, but also of the law school. So we certainly appreciate you being here today. Uh, we've approached this in a couple of different ways. Uh, one way that I've done is to simply ask you what you're up to these days, and then we can go start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing these days? Well, I played tennis yesterday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Good. So, <laughs> Still and, with that. Right. And so I'm, I play tennis about three or four times a week. Mm -hmm. Uh, mostly doubles, but singles once a week. Uh, I also uh, served as Master of Ceremonies at the latest uh, Law School Distinguished Achievement Awards dinner, uh, the one that honored Justice Nakamura, uh, Alicia Gutierrez, and Benny Naranjo. Uh, so I tried to lace that up with a number of, of jokes, uh -huh. funny things to keep <laughs> the audience uh, attentive. Uh, and I'm doing some part-time work for the city of Albuquerque um, city attorney's office, mm -hmm. helping them with the uh, Albuquerque Police Department and the um, consent decree entered into be between the city of Albuquerque and the Department of Justice concerning uh, uh, the allegations of excessive force used by the Albuquerque Police Department. So I've been doing some training. I helped um, look at their um, policies on use of force, and so, but it's part time, mm -hmm. no more than twenty five percent, because I am retired. <laughs> or as my wife has said, I failed retirement three times, so I'm trying to <laughs> succeed this time. Trying to get it right this right. time. Yeah. Uh, so are you still affiliated with the law school in terms of teaching or anything like that? I taught my last class in the spring of 2020 when COVID hit mm -hmm. and I had to complete teaching that class in, on Zoom and I said, no mas, yeah. I'd, I'd had enough. I didn't care for teaching or I couldn't be in person with the students and uh -huh. they couldn't be in person with each other. So. I haven't taught since then. Okay. Well, we'll come back to that. Um, before we started today, we were talking a little bit about where yeah. you grew up. Uh, can you go ahead and tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Uh, sure. I was born in Albuquerque during the war. That's World War II. Mm -hmm. And my dad was um, in Idaho. Uh, he was working for the Department of Agriculture, and he was um, responsible for hiring, going down to Mexico, hiring Mexican laborers, transporting them up to uh, Idaho, and then contracting with the Idaho farmers um, for labor, because most of the Idaho boys were out fighting in World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was born in Albuquerque, and my mother then took me on the train back up to Idaho, and so I lived the first six years of my life in Idaho. Um, including first grade. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, uh, you know, English is my first language. I mean, I heard a lot of Spanish at home. My parents were both uh, native Spanish speakers. Uh, my grandparents didn't speak much English at all. Mm -hmm. But, you know, growing up in Idaho, uh, I learned English first and then I learned Spanish the, from my grandparents. And of course, my parents, when they spoke in Spanish to each other, thinking that they were <laughs> keeping things from us. <laughs> but you were able to understand it. <laughs> yeah, and I actually, so I actually am pretty bilingual. I've taught in Spanish down in Argentina and in Mexico uh, and in Paraguay. Uh, but it is, I would not call it my first language. Right. Uh, and after Idaho? Well, after Idaho, um, it was after the war and my dad uh, got a job as the principal 
for the high school, oh, the whole school in Pecos, New Mexico. And so we moved there and I went from second through seventh grade in Pecos. And then my dad got a job at uh, West Las Vegas as a deputy superintendent at West Las Vegas High School, uh, or school system. And so we moved to Las Vegas and I did not want to move there. Um, I thought I had the perfect life in Pecos. Uh, for a young kid, it was sort of like Huckleberry Finn. Uh, we had the river, we had um, the canyon, we could fish, we had abandoned mines. Um, I, I didn't want to leave, and I thought I had a vote. Uh, I didn't even get a vote. Uh, but anyway, we moved to Las Vegas. I started there in eighth grade and finished my high school there. Um, and then I went away, went away to college. Is that where you started playing tennis, was in high school? Uh, my junior year. Actually, I was a basketball player. Oh, really? That was my best sport. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up playing basketball on Pecos, which didn't have a gym. It was just a dirt court <laughs> outdoors, and I learned to play there. And I guess I learned well enough because I was able to uh, uh, you know, be the, on the make the varsity and starting five at, at Robertson High School for um, for my last two three years, uh -huh. and then I actually played basketball for uh, uh, a year and a half at Oberlin. Is that how you got to Oberlin? Was on a scholarship? Never, they don't offer <laughs> athletic scholarship. So how did it happen that you went to Oberlin? Actually, I had a teacher, a high school English teacher, and she had a cousin who was a professor of physics at Oberlin and said, I think that would be a really good school for you. And so I never heard of it. So mm -hmm. I asked my m mom and dad, they'd never heard of it. And then probably a week or so later, there was an article in Time Magazine featuring Oberlin College. I don't remember what it was about. My dad read it and said, I think that would be a good school for you. So I applied and uh, took the train from the Las Vegas, uh, about 40 hour ride, uh, and went east for the first time. Ended up there and actually got a good education and got my wife there, so. What was your major? History. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And was your wife attending Oberlin at the time? Yeah, we were both classmates. Mm -hmm. uh, she came from Rochester, New York, and she was uh, talented in music. Uh, so she was able to, uh, good enough, so she could study in the Conservatory of Music at Oberlin. Um, uh, and, but she was also an English major but she studied piano and organ at, at Oberlin. And, uh, we were both freshmen. She was one of the first girls I met and dated. And she was, of course, the last one. <laughs> <laughs> and you all have been married for a few years. 58 years. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And so you actually played uh, basketball at Oberlin for a right. year or so? Mm -hmm. Yeah, enjoyed it. But I picked up tennis, going back to your other question, mm -hmm. um, after my sophomore year, because I'd played Little League baseball, you know, Babe Ruth baseball, I'm playing for high school baseball, and one of the, the summer between my sophomore and junior year, uh, a friend of mine and I found old tennis rackets uh, that our fathers had used, and so we took them out and we uh, would hit tennis balls after baseball practice, and one afternoon, one of the tennis, uh, one of the guys on the tennis team at Robertson High School came by, and uh, so we hit with them, and I was able to hit with them, and I said, you know, I like this sport. <laughs> so I switched to, to tennis. Uh, so I was not, uh, the, Las Vegas had a really good tennis program, or at least had a good tennis family. Um, they were always get winning district and state, and so I was never at their league. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I didn't play at all until I uh, started teaching and found that uh, it was a good escape mm -hmm. from the pressure of teaching. And so, and it's a sport. You can play uh, as, as long as you live, uh -huh. as long as you keep your knees okay <laughs> and your shoulders okay. 
That's what uh, Judge Garcia has told me, Tim yeah. Garcia. <laughs> right. Yeah. I still remember playing against him when he came to law school. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I should say playing. He taught me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, he's quite the athlete, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so was there a connection between your dad and mom and Pecos when they went there? or No, actually, my parents met at the University of New Mexico. Uh, my dad was from... Uh, a little village in northern New Mexico, El Valle. Mm -hmm. It's a suburb of Penasco. <laughs> a little mountain village right on the Trampas River, mm -hmm. Rio de las Trampas. And he uh, and his brother were sent by my grandfather down to Manal. Um, and I think at the age of 10, my dad not, did not know a word of English. And uh, so he went to Manal lived in the dorms, and he uh, was held back a year because he didn't know English. And then a couple years later, they passed him, you know, accelerated him, so he caught up with that year. And then when he uh, graduated, the, uh, uh, the teachers and the headmaster at Manal said that he should go to college and that uh, uh, he could live at Manal as a counselor uh, so he was getting his room and board for free and was able with it to walk to UNM and that's where he got his undergraduate degree. And my mother was from uh, Belen. Okay. So she was Rio Abajo and my dad from Rio Riva. Uh -huh. And uh, the nuns told her that she should go to college. She told my grandfather he said, nah, that's not a place for a woman. You gotta you know, get married and have children. Uh, the nuns then visited my grandfather and changed his mind. <laughs> so she went to UNM and stayed with one of her uncles who lived here in Albuquerque. And the two of them met at UNM and uh, they both uh, got education degrees. And so uh, they both are be educators. Uh -huh. yeah. My mother was an elementary school teacher. My dad was a principal and deputy superintendent, and um, that's uh, those are my my roots. Uh -huh. Did and you have siblings? I had uh, two sisters and one brother, mm -hmm. and we all got college degrees because my parents were the first uh -huh. uh, in their families to go to college, um, and so education was very important to them, and. I mean, insisted, uh, in fact, you, if you'd asked me at the age of six or seven what I was going to do, I would have told you I'm going to college because mm -hmm. my parents <laughs> ingrained that in mm -hmm. me. Uh, the family believed in education? Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. So you got a history degree at Oberlin. Right. And what were, what were your plans after you got that degree? I wasn't sure, but I was thinking about graduate school in history. Mm -hmm. And then I got a call from the um, career counselor at Oberlin and asked me to come into her office and she told me that Washington University in St. Louis was offering a full tuition scholarship to an Oberlin graduate and s s suggested that I apply and I said well I really hadn't thought about law school and she said well just apply you can always make your, des your decision later uh, if they admit you then you can decide whether you want to go or not Anyway, they admitted me, gave me a full tuition scholarship. Uh, they renewed it for my second year and for my third year, so I never paid a penny of tuition for law school. Uh, I feel very much indebted to that university for, for providing that education. Were there any other New Mexico attendees at the time you were there? No, <laughs> not at all. No. You were the New Mexico representative. I guess so, right. <laughs> Did you have any idea when you were at Washington as to the type of law you wanted to practice or what you wanted to do? Uh, no, I really didn't have much of an idea on, until probably my third year when uh, I thought about uh, uh, criminal law. Mm -hmm. And that's when I heard about this Prettyman Fellowship Program at and again, this was um, featured in, I think, in Time Magazine about this new program uh, called the Prettyman Fellowship Program at Georgetown University Law School. 
uh, it sounded really good because it would be um, a fellowship program in criminal law and litigation. Uh, Two-year program, uh, I think it paid $6,500 the first year and $7,500 the second year. That was, that was good money, <laughs> I mean, after going through law school. Uh, so I applied and I was accepted and I showed up in Washington, D.C. as a young, um, young lawyer and cut my teeth as a young lawyer in Washington, D.C. What was that experience like? It was really um, career changing in many ways because uh, it was a, indicated it was a two year fellowship program. It was funded by the Ford Foundation and it was designed to train criminal defense lawyers to be competent lawyers because um, in 1963, U.S. Supreme Court decided Gideon versus Wainwright, giving the right to counsel to indigents. And as a result, um, all these defendants now had the right to counsel even if they couldn't afford one. Before Gideon versus Wainwright, you had the right to counsel if you could pay one. Mm -hmm. um, but after Gideon, if you couldn't pay for one, one had to be appointed for you. So anyway, the, the, there were a number of judges, uh, cross federal judges, who were concerned about the level of competency of defense lawyers. They found that prosecutors were pretty well trained and they were basically outmatched uh, uh, the defense lawyers, except you know the high-priced ones. But for most of the people getting charged with felonies, indigents, uh, the lawyers were uh, just getting appointed, and they really didn't have any expertise. They didn't have uh, any trial skills. So this program was designed to alleviate that problem. So they accepted uh, in our pretty big fellowship program, one person from each of the federal circuits. Um, I think I was, there was already someone from Colorado, so from the 10th circuit, so I was actually from the 8th circuit, because from St. Louis. Right. Um, so anyway, it was a two-year program, started out, uh, first day they handed me a, a, a file. I was going to argue a case, uh, write a brief and write a uh, and argue a case before the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Um, and the, uh, the director of our program said, as soon as you become licensed in the District of Columbia, uh, you'll be entering your appearance and I'm going to get, off, get my name off of the, <laughs> off the docket. <laughs> so uh, I was, actually I could have been admitted on motion in D.C. because I took the New Mexico bar exam and the D.C. bar exam the same summer. Wow. Um, summer of 1968. Um, and actually, I was admitted in New Mexico before they uh, finished grading the exams in D.C. Wow. Of course, they had a lot more uh, examinees to, to grade. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, Shortly after we got there, they assigned us uh, to do preliminary hearings in uh, federal magistrate court. And after we'd had six of those, then we started taking appointments in felony cases in federal district court. So I learned to practice in federal court. And so, and at that time, all of the uh, felonies in the District of Columbia were tried in federal court. There was no superior court as there is now, um, like a state D.C. court mm -hmm. that didn't exist at that time. So all uh, crimes under the D.C. code were prosecuted in federal court by uh, assistant uh, United States attorneys. So I went up against some very accomplished, very good uh, federal prosecutors. And in fact, one of them the later defended uh, uh, President Clinton in, uh, in his impeachment and uh -huh. also in the affair that it, the allegations that were, happened in Arkansas. Uh -huh. uh, oh my goodness. So, uh, yeah, he was a young assistant, <laughs> assistant U.S. attorney and I was a young uh, Prettyman fellow 
And so we went head to head on a, on a federal uh, hijacking case. Wow. So, uh, so for two years you did exclusively federal criminal cases. Right. Did it, they kind of run the gamut in terms of types of felonies? Yeah, there, we had some drug cases. Um, uh, I had uh, a robbery case that I told you, hijacking. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I even tried an insan insanity defense. Um, so I, uh, it was a very learning experience. And what's interesting is that the, in my second year, a kid from New Mexico shows up as a Prettyman fellow by the name of uh, Chuck Daniels, oh my goodness. Charlie Daniels, <laughs> and so he was uh, uh, the year behind me in the Prettyman program, mm -hmm. and he, and before you could try a felony case, we would get appointed to a federal ca a felony case. You had to have uh, two co-counsel cases. So one of Chuck's. Um, co-counsel cases was with me and we had a great time work, working together and uh, trying this case uh, in in Washington DC. Uh, so you both completed the program? Right, he was a year behind me mm -hmm. and uh, we both completed that program. So we graduated from that program with an LLM, a master's in uh, in law. Uh -huh. And what year was that? And I was, I that finished it in 1970. Uh -huh. And what what was your career path after that? Well, because uh, I go back a little, uh, little ways here. The Ford Foundation um, was interested in introducing clinical education into law school education, and so they established these. Uh, uh, these funds for law schools to apply for to establish clinical programs. So law schools applied for these uh, funds, they got them, then they had to figure out who's going to teach them. <laughs> because um, at the time I went to law school, uh, there were no skills courses, there were no clinical courses, there was no trial practice courses. It was all doctrinal courses. And so the faculty at these, at all these American law schools, uh, for the most part, were ill-equipped to teach a, a clinical program. So a lot of law schools came to the Prettyman program at Georgetown, um, figuring that we probably had some skills that they, we could, uh, could use. Mm -hmm. uh, so a number of law schools contacted us, and the one that made me the best, made the best offer for me was at Dickinson Law School in Pennsylvania. And uh, they offered a tenure track position, teaching, uh, setting up a clinic, teaching half time in a clinic and teaching half time in, um, in the regular curriculum, which would be criminal law and criminal procedure for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I taught that, taught there for two years. And at one of the uh, annual meetings of the Association of American Law Schools, I ran into Al Utten on an escalator. And he says, Joe Romero. And I said, yeah. And he said, where are you from? And I said, can he saw Dickinson? And I said, well, I'm at uh, Dickinson Law School. And he said, but from where? And I said, well, from New Mexico. He said, what are you doing there? You should be here at, U at UNM. And so uh, very shortly thereafter, I got an invitation to come out and interview for, the, uh, for a position on the faculty. And uh, they offered me a position, and I told my wife, I'm coming home. <laughs> <laughs> Had your wife been to New Mexico before, I take it? Oh, yeah. 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 She, yeah. Because we got married in 1965, mm -hmm. and then I was in law school from 65 to 68. But so we'd, uh, for every vacation, when I was in law school in St. Louis, we'd go one vacation to New Mexico. The next one, we go to Rochester, New York, to visit her family, and so, and she loved northern New Mexico. Uh, she didn't care very much for Albuquerque. She thought it was too brown, too dry, <laughs> not enough water. Uh, but she loved northern New Mexico, and she loved uh, my grandfather, um, who was, and he really liked her too, because my wife was. Pretty straightforward, you know, not, and 
you know, like my dad and his brothers never uh, had a beer or anything in front of my grandfather. And we were up in, up in Elvira, and then I went up fishing with my dad. I did. Mm -hmm. And Robin was pregnant, and she stayed with my grandfather, and uh, he said, go up to the cabin, open that cabinet, and there was a little bottle of bourbon in there, and he said, pour some for you and me. <laughs> when my dad came home and saw my wife drinking with his father, he practically dropped it down. <laughs> that, can't, that had never happened before. That had never happened before. <laughs> That's uh, funny. Uh, and my wife said, I didn't think anything wrong with that. Sure. It was fun. We were having a good time. Yeah, Grandpa invited. Uh, <laughs> well, that was a fortuitous uh, escalator ride to, to meet Al. When you yeah. got here, were Fred and Desi already here? Yeah, Fred and Desi were here. Um, Joe Goldberg had started a semester before me. Mm -hmm. um, Ann Bingaman had uh, just started. Um, Ted Parnell was here. Uh, so th it was a very small faculty at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I came in to essentially teach criminal law and criminal procedure, um, replacing Henry Wyhoven, who had re just retired because at that time there was a mandatory retirement to age 65. Oh, wow. And so he retired and I was uh, hired to fill that particular slot. Also coming in with me, was uh, Cruz Reynoso. We were both hired in, to start in the fall of 1972. We were both uh, the first two uh, Hispanic professors at the law school. And for the benefit of the audience, he went on to become a well, Supreme Court Justice in yeah, California? Yeah, well, in, uh, I think in 19, about four years later, uh, he was appointed by the governor of California to the Court of Appeals, okay. California Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. And after two or four years on the Court of Appeals, he was then appointed by the governor to the Supreme Court of California. Right. And so he and I uh, really bonded. His office was next to mine, and uh, I learned a lot from him. Mm -hmm. And he was about 12 years older than I. Um, but he was just a marvelous human being, um, dedicated to justice. Um, but he was also just a warm person who could uh, uh, earn the respect of his um, adversaries and his colleagues. He was, a, he was very influential to me, and I think to the rest of the faculty. Because uh, he came to California after leading CRLA, California Rural Legal Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. And he had uh, fought the, the, I think it was actually it was uh, Governor Reagan at that time, who was trying to kill legal services. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Cruz went to Washington, D.C. and lobbied and got uh, Congress to uh, continue the uh, funding mm -hmm. for legal services. So he was a, a hero of legal services attorneys and civil rights attorneys. Uh, across the nation. He, he was well known when uh, our law school plucked him out of uh, California and brought him to New Mexico. Did he have any influence on legal services in New Mexico? Well, uh, he was on the, uh, I don't remember directly, but I do know the one thing that we both did, and that is we got involved in uh, challenging the New Mexico State um, bar exam. Okay. Um, when you, this was, since we started in 1972, I think it was probably around 73 or 74, um, there was a dismal pass rate uh, in the New Mexico bar exam, especially for minorities, which are primarily Hispanic students. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the students, the graduates who we had taught came to Cruz and to me and asked if we could help them and so we started doing some investigation and thought we had uh, the basis for uh, a lawsuit. Um, but Cruz had the connections to uh, Maldef and 
he knew the uh, general counsel of MALDEF at the time and called him and uh, uh, the general counsel for MALDEF said, uh, we'll fund it and we'll come down and uh, litig help litigate this case for you. So we had this big hearing before the Supreme Court. Um, we had an expert on testing and who was reviewed the testing process uh, here in New Mexico and said that it was deficient in many, many ways. Um, and as a result of that testimony, uh, the expert testimony, the, uh, the bar exam was changed and the whole process was changed. Um, but before that, uh, you know, it was, there were just a number of different procedures that were just uh, uh, violated all of the principles of valid testing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, and as a result of that, the next year the pass rate went up, I think, from 65% to uh, right around 80%. And it stayed there for a long time. Uh, so that was, I think, a, a significant uh, case for New Mexico because it not only benefited the Hispanic students, but it benefited all of the students um, who were. Uh, did not pass the exam, and maybe in part because of the process that was used just was not fair. Mm -hmm. and, and what year was it that you all had the hearing? I think it was 1974, uh -huh. um, maybe 75. I don't can't re I'd have to go back and look mm -hmm. at my calendar. And MALDEF was the Mexican American Legal Defense right. Fund. Yeah. Yep. And so I don't know, it was based out of San Francisco. Um, and Cruz knew everybody, and everybody knew Cruz, so mm -hmm. he had those connections that was really helpful. Uh, but that was an, imp an important case. When you came back, you know, kind of being recruited from Dickinson, yeah. did you help establish a clinical program uh, here at UNM? Was that part of your... It was just starting, uh -huh. and I... Uh, <laughs> I think Bill McPherson had just been hired, and so he started it. And then uh, students wanted a criminal defense clinic. And so it was uh, sort of, uh, they called it Centro Legal, but they didn't have a faculty supervisor. So that was one of my first teaching assignments, was to um, set up uh, Centro Legal as a criminal defense clinic. and. We did that. Um, that was one of my first uh, assignments. The other course that I was asked to teach was criminal law, and there were no sections at the time. And maybe the same when you were in school. My bad. I think I had you know 110 <laughs> students in uh, room 2401. It was a big class. Big class. <laughs> and the other class I taught was evidence trial practice, and I started that class. Um, and I think we were the first school to combine evidence and trial practice. And both courses go together. Mm -hmm. I mean, evidence tells you what you can introduce in court and trial. And so for trial practice, you need to know evidence. So I combined that into a six unit course. Um, and that course uh, continues till today. Um, well, maybe you can tell us a little bit of the evolution of the clinical program, you know, while you were there, because yeah. I know that now, I mean, it's one of the most well thought of yeah. clinical programs in the nation. Right. So it evolved from Central Legal to then you had evidence trial practice, and then did it continue to grow? Yeah, so basically, we're talking about skills courses. And again, when I was in law school, there were essentially no skills courses. Um, so, in clinic and uh, legal education really changed during the first five or six years that I started teaching. I mean, it was a, like it was a sea change. Um, so I digress a little bit, but um, first of all, when I was in law school, there were essentially no women. One woman in in my uh, my class. There were almost no minorities. Uh, there was one. 
African American in my class at Washington University. Um, and when I came to UNM, we were just starting to, uh, as I told you, get the clinic with Bill McPherson, then Mike Norwood, Helene Simpson, um, and they had what was basically like a poverty law office. You know, and that was the, the program that they were uh, starting. And then I had the Central Legal, which was the criminal defense clinic. Uh, so, um, and it continued to evolve uh, in the sense that I still remember uh, a faculty meeting when we decided to make it a required course for graduation, mm -hmm. and then six hours of credit. Um, and that was really revolutionary. Um, most law schools didn't have clinical programs, and if they did, it was an elective, and not many students could partake in it. And so, uh, in many law schools, you know, maybe 10 or 15 students could take clinic in their whole you know, law school career. And we basically said, every student's gonna take it. So that was really revolutionary. Uh, and it really, I think, put our law school on the map. Uh, uh, we were really considered the leader in clinical education for, for years and years. Do you find that there's still some law schools throughout the country that don't have that clinic requirement? Yeah, a lot of schools still do not have the clinic requirement. They, uh, they've expanded their clinical programs, uh, but and make it available to more students. Um, but very few schools require it as a uh, graduation requirement. Well, as you were yeah. saying, in addition to working in the clinical area, you are also yeah. teaching criminal law. Right. Um, and I know that, I know that yeah. you've written some things and right. been involved uh, to some extent with the legislature and the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about mm -hmm. what you've done and your scholarship in that area? Okay, well, uh, excuse me. I, very early on, focused a lot of my scholarship on New Mexico criminal law. And I wrote a series of articles on uh, mens rea, which was always a favorite topic of mine, uh, and, and also on homicide. I wrote a, uh, an article on. Uh, uh, Willful, deliberate, and murder. Also, uh, uh, on manslaughter. Uh, I can't. And a number of those articles were cited by the New Mexico Supreme Court. I know uh, Justice uh, uh, Baca, Justice uh, Montgomery. They all uh, cited a lot of my articles on on those topics. Uh, so. I felt like I contributed a little bit to the um, development of the law in those areas uh, because of my scholarship, but I thought that was uh, something very important. And it also, I think, helped my teaching mm -hmm. in the sense that I was able to uh, incorporate in my courses a lot of New Mexico cases. Because, as you probably recall, we used national uh, case books. And the case books included cases, you know, from California, New York, and maybe some other states. Um, but I wanted my students to uh, know s some of the peculiarities of New Mexico law, uh, the New Mexico, you know, statutes, um, and some of the New Mexico uh, cases that were uh, really quite revolutionary. Mm -hmm. So, like, like the case that. Uh, uh, basically changed the felony murder rule in New Mexico. Um, uh, and basically, I think, eliminated the old felony murder doctrine mm -hmm. and made felony murder essentially an aggravating factor uh, for sentencing. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, those are the kinds of uh, uh, things that I enjoyed doing and glad that I was able to contribute in that way. And in your law school career, you mentioned earlier that you had actually taught in Argentina. Did you go to other countries to teach while you were a faculty member at UNM? Well, I, I taught in a lot of different places. Uh -huh. um, my wife says I've, I've got this wanderlust. <laughs> but I taught, um, spent a year teaching at the University of Oregon. 
I spent a year teaching at GW, George Washington University. Um, I spent a, a semester teaching at Stanford Law School, spent a semester at Hastings um, College of Law in San Francisco, a semester at Suffolk in Boston, primarily because I had grandchildren there, <laughs> and then a semester at uh, Southwestern Law School in Los Angeles because I had grandchildren there. Uh, and then I did my first sabbatical was to Argentina, and I spent a, a semester there, and I was gave a number of lectures at um, at a number of the universities in Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. um, University of Belgrano, uh, the University of Buenos Aires, uh, uh, University Universidad uh, del Salvador, which was a Catholic university, the law school. Um, so I had to deliver those lectures in, in Spanish. And were you teaching criminal law? Uh, I was not teaching at that time. Mm -hmm. I was um, basically doing research. I wanted oh. to understand the um, civil law system, mm -hmm. how it operated. So I was there on a sabbatical, not as a teacher, but as really as a researcher. And I was talked to these professors and talked to judges. Uh, to lawyers, uh, trying to understand how um, the civil system of criminal procedure works, whereas everything is written, mm -hmm. um, where you don't have um, tr open trials, uh, you don't have you know cross examination, and and it's the old uh, inquisitorial system, and mm -hmm. I was interested in learning about that. Um, and actually, when I came back to the law school, I used a lot of those concepts as a way of comparing how our system is different, how it operates, what are the assumptions in our, under our system, um, and what are the assumptions under the inquisitorial system that exists in uh, most of Europe and South America. Mm -hmm. uh, Quite a bit of it's still inquisitorial, I guess, is that right? For the most part. They've incorporated some aspects of uh, the Anglo-American um, you know, adversary system, mm -hmm. uh, but still they start from the assumption that if you want to find out the truth, you get a judge who doesn't have any interest to do the investigation and find out where the truth is. Mm -hmm. um, we start from an assumption that if you want to find the truth, you ask the people who have the most to lose or gain to go dig out, you do the investigation, fight find out what the, the facts are, and then you have this clash of two versions mm -hmm. and a trial, and out of this clash, uh, the truth will emerge. <laughs> it comes a just result. <laughs> right. So it's just very different assumptions mm -hmm. about how you get at truth. Interesting. Yeah. And did you do the teaching throughout your law school uh, teaching career? Did you, yeah. or was it kind of in a clumped period of time? or? I was always teaching. Uh, but uh, I mean, in the, these other places, uh, kind oh, of spread but, it out. When you, yeah, but you raise another interesting question. One of the th things that uh, I think was important to me was that I wanted to be not only an academic, but I also wanted to be a, a lawyer mm -hmm. who actually litigated cases and. Fortunately, I've been able to do that. I think through clinical program, um, I was able to. Uh, and since I'm licensed in New Mexico, you know, I'm. Uh, I passed the bar here in 1968, so I've been a lawyer here. Uh, 55, 55 years, um, and so I'm licensed in New Mexico. So. I always took some cases with, uh, with, Chuck, with Chuck Daniels, with Bill Dixon, um, with Ray Tuig. Uh, so I would, they would ask me to get involved with them in certain cases that were interesting and challenging. And uh, so I've always had uh, a foot mm -hmm. in the practice side, um, but mostly on the academic side. And some of those cases that you tried, were they civil rights in addition to yeah. criminal law cases? Or? Uh, one was a civil rights case mm -hmm. uh, in Hobbs mm -hmm. um, uh, involving a, 
a, um, um, a case for a police officer uh, and our client got into, uh, into an altercation. Um, but one of the other most interesting cases I had uh, was representing Ray Vargas. I don't know if you've ever... Yeah. He was... Um, a senator or something? Yeah, he was a mm -hmm. state senator. Uh, he was a lawyer. And he was being investigated by the uh, feds, the Fed, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, they made this claim that he was uh, billing a... Uh, uh, essentially, it was a child uh, welfare agency um, that dealt with mental illness, and he was representing them. And he was, uh, but this agency got federal money, mm -hmm. and so the feds thought he was uh, um, fraudulently billing. And so Bill Dixon um, was hired by Ray Vargas, and Bill Dixon then brought me into the case. And we kept telling the U.S. Attorney's Office, you don't have, a, you don't have a case. There's no facts here. Uh, but they wanted to see his uh, client files. And we said, you can't do that. That's uh, privileged. And so um, they then got a federal judge to order the uh, uh, that we turn over all of his client files. We appealed that. And I argued that case twice before the United States Court of Appeals in the Tenth Circuit. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we lost in both of those. I thought I was raising a very interesting uh, uh, Fifth Amendment privilege that it would be uh, a violation of his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination for him to turn over his uh, client files. Uh, and actually, that, and we actually petition for cert to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, we didn't get cert granted, but uh, a couple years later, the Supreme Court granted cert on a similar issue, and we would have prevailed. But the bottom line is we turned over those uh, his client files. They looked through them and dismissed the case. They just said, we don't have a case here. Uh, but anyway, poor Ray Vargas was dragged through the mud, and uh, it was really horrible. And, uh, uh, and Bill Dixon and I were really uh, did everything we could to um, preserve his, you know, his mm -hmm. good name. But that it took a real toll on sure. him. And now his daughter is a member of the New Mexico Supreme Court, Julie Vargas. Right. Yeah. And is his son Ray Vargas? Yeah. Jr.? Right. Yeah. A, a very good lawyer. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So you did some practice, and then at some point, you became dean of the law school. Yeah. How right. did that all happen? <laughs> well, nobody else wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess Ted Parnell uh, preceded me. And so uh, there was, and he had appointed me as an associate dean. Um, and so I was basically the associate dean for, I guess, two years. And so uh, he and I guess my colleagues thought uh, I didn't screw it up. <laughs> I was familiar with all of the issues at the law school and I would be a, a good dean. Mm -hmm. In fact, now that you mention it, uh, the faculty went over to the provost's office and said, we know who we want as our next dean me, and we don't need to go through a national search. And the provost said, yeah, well, I think we should go through a national search. He said, I think following the process is good. Mm -hmm. And if you pick him, he'll be a lot stronger dean because he will have gone up against uh, uh, competition in a national search. So mm -hmm. they opened up the search nationally. Uh, I applied and um, I was, uh, picked uh, to be the, the dean, so. And what year was that? 91. 91. Right. And was that the year, or was it shortly after that, that mm -hmm. the new method of selecting judges came It in? had just started. Uh -huh. uh, and so I was really there at the very beginning. And 
I helped, uh, I convened a committee of uh, someone from the Supreme Court. Um, I think it was, I think it was, it was Ransom, who was a, a, somebody from the Court of Appeals and a, a couple of district court judges and a couple of metro court judges and a couple of and somebody from the spring from the state bar uh, to draft rules mm -hmm. for a procedure f governing the judicial selection process and i did the drafting and i would take it to the to the committee and they would tweak it um, but essentially we got those rules uh, passed and then we took it to every single commission uh, that then passed uh, you know, in a vote, the adoption of those rules. They're in you know, the New Mexico statutes annotated. Uh, but that's one of the things that, uh, that I essentially steered. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was quite a change from the way the judges were selected well, before. Yeah. And uh, so I've, I forget how many judicial selection commissions I uh, chaired, um, but at, after I finished my term as dean, I, after the new method of selecting judges had been in effect for 10 years, uh, I wrote an article in the New Mexico Law Review, uh, essentially evaluating its uh, success. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I did was compare how women and minorities had done, how, how they had fared in terms of getting on the bench before the amendment and then after the new judicial selection uh, system and the data clearly showed that minorities and women were did better under a system of um, you know of a screening process nomination to the governor and then appointment by the governor and i also looked to see how they fared in the partisan election mm -hmm. following that mm -hmm. and again the data showed that if they were nominated and appointed, their odds of winning the partisan election were very, very high. Um, and the people who fared the worst were those who applied, did not get nominated, and then challenged the person who was appointed. Uh -huh. uh, but anyway, all that data is in, uh, in that Law Review article. That was, uh, and you did that for how many years? You, you were dean for how long? Six years. Six years. Right. That's a lot of commissions. I did. There was quite a few. So the governors at that time, were they Governor Johnson and then Governor Richardson? Or? No, it was, uh, well, I think it started out with, I think, Gary Carruthers okay. may have been the first one, mm -hmm. and then it was uh, Bruce King, and then uh, following, Johnson. then Gary Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are the ones that I dealt with. Okay during that period of time. Uh -huh. And we also looked to see uh, whether you know, the governor's political affiliation made a difference in terms of their appointments. And clearly it did. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> no surprise. Uh, uh, but it was an interesting process to see from the very beginning, because we had to flesh it out, because uh, you know the amendment is in the Constitution and it was but there was no guidance on how to do no, it. No, no guidance on that. Right. So we uh, basically started from scratch uh -huh. uh, and put together the, uh, the process. So you were dean then for that period of time, and then after that, did you continue teaching at the law school? Yeah, I continued teaching. Um, I taught on full time up until 2010. Mm -hmm. At the end of 2010, uh, I put in. Uh, 38 years as a faculty member, and I wanted to to do more tr more freedom of time uh, to travel, go visit grandchildren. Um, but I continued to teach at the law school as an emeritus faculty member part time. Mm -hmm. So I continued to teach one semester for about five years, and I thought, why am I teaching full time for one semester? So then I shifted to Part-time one semester, part-time the second semester gave me more flexibility. And that was that still in the criminal law area yep. that you were teaching? And then I started a new course probably, I don't know, 
probably shortly after 2000 um, called Criminal Law and Practice. Um, and this was a course uh, designed to have students assigned to both the DA's office and to the public defender's office. And they would be, uh, we would be meeting together because I wanted to, uh, each student had a separate supervisor. So the DA students had a separate DA mm -hmm. who was a supervising attorney. Same, the students in the public defender's office had a separate supervisor. Uh, so I wasn't doing individual supervising, but I organized the course. I insisted that uh, all the supervisor have at least five years of trial experience. And then I had a, a, a senior DA and a senior public defender, at least 10 years experience, who uh, I called them coordinators, and they picked the individual supervisors. And they also co-taught the, the classroom component. And so we would take each topic in criminal procedure, um, you know, for example, discovery, and we had have the the DA's perspective on discovery. We'd get the public defender's perspective on discovery, and then we had some exercises where uh, uh, we bring in police officers who would uh, then go through a, a simulated uh, pretrial interview. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had a lot of the simulations. But what I wanted the students to see, I wanted the DA's, students in the DA's program to see what was the perspective from the public defenders and the public defenders students to see uh, what a criminal case is from the perspective of a, a DA and to see what the pressures were from mm -hmm. each side. You know, the DA's got pressures from the victims, from the press, um, the public defenders, they have pressure from their own clients. Sometimes they don't want to, uh, sometimes they want to go to trial. Sometimes their families don't want them to. Um, and, in a, and you can't force a client to plead, even if it's in the client's best interest. You can say, uh, give them advice about it. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a, uh, it's a client's decision. And so, well, that sounds like yeah. a, uh, an experience that, frankly, you wouldn't even get if you went out and practiced one side. Right. I mean, that that's yeah. a pretty broad-based, intense course, it sounds right. like. And I think I just wanted them to respect the other side. Mm -hmm. and, and also to emphasize how you could get more done by cooperating on issues that were not important and fight on those issues that were mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to fight over every little thing. You lose your credibility. You lose your effectiveness. Uh, uh, so anyway, it was. I thought that was uh, that. Kate, that course is still going on. So That's wonderful. Uh, is that you know when you talk about the issues of credibility and yeah. that being ex crucial uh, for a person practicing law, is that something that that you try to impart throughout your other courses too? Oh, always. Um, it, I think one of the things I brought to the classroom is that I've, I've been in court. Mm -hmm. I've tried cases. I've won cases. I've lost cases. And I've, I've dealt in, with judges. And, uh, and I emphasize you know, what, uh, what can be effective, what will be ineffective um, in terms of being civil, being polite, um, being respectful. Um, not backing down necessarily, making sure you make a record, all those things I'd emphasize in my, you know, evidence and trial practice class or in criminal, or teaching criminal procedure or criminal law. Well, with your long experience both in educating probably most of the lawyers in New Mexico, yeah. uh, as well as yeah. practicing and, and, you know, the, the clinical yeah. aspect of it, what has been your view of kind of the evolution of legal education and the evolution of the practice in New Mexico? Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of evolution of legal education, I think the, the big thing is, uh, again, introduction of skills courses uh, into law school. And, and we're now starting in first year in incorporating some clinical type skills things so students can see 
uh, that it's, it's not just reading cases. You know, there's a, there's a client, there's a case, there's an issue. Um, and trying to get students in the very first semester uh, understanding how the, the process, you know, legal process works. Uh, so I think that's been a, a major, uh, major change. Um, and again, also the notion that now that we have uh, uh, many more minority students, minority faculty, uh, I think our classes have been close to 55 to 60 percent women. Mm -hmm. uh, a major, major change uh, from the time that I went to law school. Uh, so I think that in legal education is probably one of the, the major changes. In terms of the, the profession, um, I think one of the major things I've seen, uh, and some of this I don't experience but I'm aware of mm -hmm. from colleagues and friends of mine who are in the practice, and that is uh, uh, there seems to be less civility. I think as a bar gets bigger uh, and you don't run into your adversary uh, You'll, if you run into an adversary once, you probably will never run into him again. And so there's not this notion that you've got an ongoing relationship that you you don't want to screw up. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's more specialization uh, than there used to be. Uh, and but I think that also one of the major things I've seen is the um, technology and legal research. I mean. Uh, I learned legal research in a library with a book. The Decennial Digest. <laughs> and I still do that. Um, but you ought to go to, if you go to the law school now, if you go to the law, law library, nobody's in there. Students go, go into the law school library. They're doing all, all their research on their computers. Uh, I think law firms are mostly doing that. Uh, I found that it's a great place to, to escape, to go read and to think, is because nobody's out in the library anymore. And, and the librarians have turned out to be, you know, to have to be really up on technology. Uh, I remember as dean, one of the, my biggest budget worries was the library budget, because it costs money to buy books, to store books. Uh, it's all these subscriptions. Uh, uh, and now uh, we have all this space, and it's not being used at all. Uh, that's, that's a major, major change. Well, when you started practice, there were no cell phones, right. uh, no computer research. Even no. when I started, there wasn't right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's quite a, a change. Yeah. Have, have you thought about how uh, AI or artificial intelligence might impact the practice of law? Only what I read. <laughs> I think it's scary. It is. Uh, I mean, I because I think the real value of a lawyer is is the creativity and uh, problem solving, and it, and that uh, maybe artificial intelligence will be able to do that at some point. But I don't think uh, I think it basically, and this is again very limited understanding. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can show a mastery of facts, of data. But uh, how you put things together, how they are related, how you uh, come up with new ideas, that, that, uh, that's the, the creative um, part of lawyering that I think is really exciting and is critical. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you've indicated that you've actually gone some places to teach because you have grandkids. Yeah. You have, you have several grandkids? All right, I've got, uh, well, my wife and I had two sons, uh, the oldest one, is a professor of biology at Tufts University. Uh, he's had the math smarts <laughs> in our family. And so he got his uh, PhD at Stanford and has been a professor at Tufts for 25 years. And he's got two boys. Uh, he and his wife uh, are also tennis players now. Um, and the youngest one just graduated from high school and is a a freshman at Tufts University, um, and his wife is a is a oncologist. She's actually from India, wow. yeah. and then uh, our other son, uh, he's a lawyer, 
uh, an oil and gas lawyer. And he went to Oberlin, just like um, uh, Robin and I, mm -hmm. uh, and he went to UCLA Law School. I know that uh, you know, a lot of Fred Hart's kids went to UNM, uh, Ted Parnell's kids went to UNM, Ted Oculitos. Uh, uh, when my wife says, why don't you think about UNM? And they're really good faculty. And he said, no way am I going to a law school where my dad's a dean and I know half the faculty by their first names. <laughs> and so he went to UCLA and it cost me a lot more money than if he'd come to UNM. And is he, is he practicing somewhere? And so he's an oil and gas lawyer and uh, he's now located in Houston. Okay. But he was with um, Occidental Oil and Gas mm -hmm. and he spent uh, a year in Dubai at one of their operations and then spent five years in uh, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, as the head lawyer for um, a subsidiary of Occidental Oil and Gas. Wow. And he's totally fluent in Spanish. And he married uh, a Puerto Rican. Uh -huh. well, she, she was born in Chicago, but her parents were from Puerto Rico. And I'll tell you something well, not interesting is that my dad, well, my grandfather from the Romero side, mm -hmm. he, uh, my grandfather, my grandmother were born and raised in the same village in El Valle, and they married. Then my dad and my mom, both born and raised in New Mexico. Then I, married someone from the, uh, in the United States, mm -hmm. but not New Mexico. And then my son, who's in Boston, married someone from, from <laughs> India, from Mumbai. So it was <laughs> the world. And my other son married someone from you know, Puerto Rican roots. So in f four generations, my grandparents, my parents, me, uh, me and then our, our sons, four generations, have gone from village to state to country to the world. Reached out to the world. Yep. I mean, it's a, that's amazing how fast things have changed. It is. And obviously the, the importance of education that started with your parents has run all the way through your family. Yeah, really has been. Yeah. They really emphasized education and, mm -hmm. and I guess it took for me. <laughs> right. So. Well, if you had to kind of sum up your thoughts about the career that you've had uh, in the legal profession, yeah. how, what, would you, what would you say about that? Wouldn't change it. I mean, it's, I've had a great career. I mean, I've, I've met really good colleagues. I've enjoyed uh, my interactions with students. Um, I've en enjoyed the intellectual challenges of uh, uh, both the practice and the academic part of law. Uh, been able to live in New Mexico. Um, been able to, you know, hike, and, uh, do, you know, travel and, I don't know, it's been really good. Been lucky. Mm -hmm. I'm, still able, I'm still able to play tennis at my age. That's wonderful. All right. So. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share with us at this point? Well, the only other passion I have that I haven't mentioned is uh, racing my Corvette. <laughs> and guess who got me into that? Who was that? Charlie Daniels. Oh, because he took racing courses, didn't he? Yeah, and he had a, and he had a, a race car, and so he said, you gotta do this. And I said, hmm, sounds interesting to me. So he took me out on the track, and uh, he got me hooked. So do you actually race in competitive races? No, I, I don't wanna <laughs> ruin my Corvette, <laughs> but I do, uh, I race against the clock. I uh -huh. time myself on laps to see uh, if, I, if I can go faster and whether taking this turn a little differently, uh, I can get a better time, a better lap time. Uh, and so it's a th it's a thrill. I mean, uh, get your adrenaline pumping. 
on that little on that road track out here on, on the west side of Albuquerque. So you do it out here in yeah. Albuquerque. Right. Well, that's interesting. Right. Right. Well, I think that our uh, audience is going to especially love to hear that. You might get an audience next time. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. That's it. yeah. Well, interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dean. Okay. This has been wonderful. I've learned a lot that that. Uh, I thought I knew something about you, but I've learned a lot more, so I really mm. appreciate it very much. Thank okay. you. I should have brought you an apple, because we were from Elvia. Oh, we, right. we were up there a week, two weeks ago. Uh -huh. and Got some nice orchards up there? A nice orchard um, that my dad and his brother, um, in 1949, um, I think bought 50 apple trees that were shipped from Missouri mm -hmm. to Las Vegas, New Mexico. My uncle went, picked them up, and they planted them on my uh, grandfather's land in Elvia. And there, those trees are still producing. They're still there? The same trees? Same trees. Interesting. Producing great uh, red delicious, golden delicious, and some uh, uh, Jonathans. Uh -huh. so, and we were just up there uh, two, week, two weeks ago. <laughs> Um, to pick the apples there because uh, my dad always said, middle of October, mm -hmm. uh, is that if you wait that much longer, you run the risk of a, a freeze up there. Right. Yeah. Well, one of these days I'm going to hit you up for one of those. Yes, I should, I should have brought one. I didn't think of it. Uh. I'm going to.